Section two of Reminiscences of Captain Grano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Reminiscences of Captain Grano by Captain Rhys Howell Grano. Section two. Mrs. Mary Anne Clark. Our army, despite its defects, was nevertheless infinitely better administered at home when I joined than it had been a few years before, owing principally to the inquiry that had taken place in the House of Commons relative to the bribery and corruption which had crept in, and which had been laid open by the confessions of a female, who created no small sensation in those days, and who eventually terminated her extraordinary career not very long since in Paris. The squibs fired off by Mrs. Mary Anne Clark had a much greater influence, and produced more effect upon the English army than all the artillery of the enemy directed against the Duke of York when commanding in Holland. This lady was remarkable for her beauty and her fascinations, and few came within the circle over which she presided who did not acknowledge her superior power. Her wit, which kept the House of Commons during her examination in a continued state of merriment, was piquant and saucy. Her answers on that occasion have been so often brought before the public that I need not repeat them, but in private life her quick repartee and her brilliant sallies rendered her a lively, though not always an agreeable, companion. As for prudence, she had none. Her dearest friend, if she had any, was just as likely to be made the object of her ridicule as the most obnoxious person of her acquaintance. Her narrative of her first introduction to the Duke of York has often been repeated, but, as all her stories were considered apocryphal, it is difficult to arrive at a real history of her career. Certain, however, is it that, about the age of sixteen, she was residing at Blackheath, a sweet, pretty, lively girl when in her daily walk across the heath she was passed on two or three occasions by a handsome well-dressed cavalier, who, finding that she recognised his salute, dismounted. Pleased with her manner and wit, he begged to be allowed to introduce a friend. Accordingly, on her consenting, a person to whom the cavalier appeared to pay every sort of deference was presented to her and the acquaintance ripened into something more than friendship. Not the slightest idea had the young lady of the position in society of her lover, until she accompanied him, on his invitation, to the theatre, where she occupied a private box, when she was surprised at the ceremony with which she was treated, and at observing that every eye and every lorgnette in the house were directed towards her in the course of the evening. She accepted this as a tribute to her beauty. Finding that she could go again to the theatre when she pleased, and occupy the same box, she availed herself of this opportunity with a female friend, and was not a little astonished at being addressed as Her Royal Highness. She then discovered that the individual into whose affections she had insinuated herself was the son of the King, the Duke of York, who had not long before united himself to a lady for whom she had been mistaken. Mrs. Mary Anne Clark was soon reconciled to the thought of being the wife of a prince by the left hand, particularly as she found herself assiduously courted by persons of the highest rank, and more especially by military men. A large house in a fashionable street was taken for her, and an establishment on a magnificent scale gave her an opportunity of surrounding herself with persons of a sphere far beyond anything she could in her younger days have dreamt of, her father having been in an honourable trade, and her husband being only a captain in a marching regiment. The Duke, delighted to see his fair friend so well received, constantly honoured her dinner-table with his presence, and willingly gratified any wish that she expressed, and he must have known, and for this he was afterwards highly censured, that her style of living was upon a scale of great expense, and that he himself contributed little towards it. The consequence was 
that the hospitable lady eventually became embarrassed, and knew not which way to turn to meet her outlay. It was suggested to her that she might obtain from the Duke commissions in the army, which she could easily dispose of at a good price. Individuals quickly came forward, ready to purchase anything that came within her grasp, which she extended not only to the army, but, as it afterwards appeared, to the church, for there were reverend personages who availed themselves of her assistance, and thus obtained patronage, by which they advanced their worldly interests very rapidly. Mrs. Mary Ann Clark and Colonel Wardle Amongst those who paid great attention to Mrs. Mary Ann Clark was Colonel Wardle, at that time a remarkable member of the House of Commons, and a bold leader of the radical opposition. He got intimately acquainted with her, and was so great a personal favourite that it was believed he wormed out all her secret history, of which he availed himself to obtain a fleeting popularity. Having obtained the names of some of the parties who had been fortunate enough, as they imagined, to secure the lady's favour, he loudly demanded an inquiry in the House of Commons as to the management of the army by the Commander-in-Chief, the Duke of York. The nation and the army were fond of His Royal Highness, and every attempt to screen him was made, but in vain. The House undertook the task of investigating the conduct of the Duke, and witnesses were produced, amongst whom was the fair lady herself, who by no means attempted to screen her imprudent admirer. Her responses to the questions put to her were cleverly and archly given, and the whole mystery of her various intrigues came to light. The Duke consequently resigned his place in the Horse Guards, and at the same time repudiated the beautiful and dangerous cause of his humiliation. The lady, incensed at the desertion of her royal swain, announced her intention of publishing his love-letters which were likely to expose the whole of the royal family to ridicule, as they formed the frequent themes of his correspondence. Sir Herbert Taylor was therefore commissioned to enter into a negotiation for the purchase of the letters. This he effected at an enormous price, obtaining a written document at the same time by which Mrs. Clarke was subjected to heavy penalties if she, by word or deed, implicated the honour of any of the branches of the royal family. A pension was secured to her, on condition that she should quit England, and reside wherever she chose on the continent. To all this she consented, and, in the first instance, went to Brussels, where her previous history being scarcely known, she was well received, and she married her daughters without any inquiry as to the fathers to whom she might ascribe them. Mrs. Clark afterwards settled quietly and comfortably in Paris, receiving occasionally visits from members of the aristocracy who had known her when mingling in a certain circle in London. The Marquis of Londonderry never failed to pay his respects to her, entertaining a very high opinion of her talents. Her manners were exceedingly agreeable, and to the latest day she retained pleasing traces of past beauty. She was lively, sprightly, and full of fun, and indulged in innumerable anecdotes of the members of the royal family of England, some of them much too scandalous to be repeated. She regarded the Duke of York as a big baby, not out of his leading-strings, and the Prince of Wales as an idle sensualist, with just enough of brains to be guided by any laughing well-bred individual who would listen to stale jokes and impudent ribaldry. Of Queen Charlotte she used to speak with the utmost disrespect, attributing to her a love of domination and a hatred of every one who would not bow down before any idol that she chose to set up, and as being envious of the Princess Caroline and her daughter the Princess Charlotte of Wales, and jealous of their acquiring too much influence over the Prince of Wales. In short, Mary Ann Clark had been so intimately let into every secret of the life of the royal family, that had she not been tied down, her revelations would have astonished the world, however willing the people might have been to believe that they were tinged with scandal and exaggeration. 
The way in which Colonel Wardle first obtained information of the sale of commissions was singular enough. He was paying a clandestine visit to Mrs. Clark when a carriage with the royal livery drove up to the door, and the gallant officer was compelled to take refuge under the sofa. But instead of the royal duke, there appeared one of his aides de camp who entered into conversation in so mysterious a manner as to excite the attention of the gentleman under the sofa, and led him to believe that the sale of a commission was authorised by the commander-in-chief, though it afterwards appeared that it was a private arrangement of the unwelcome visitor. At the horse-guards it had often been suspected that there was a mystery connected with commissions that could not be fathomed, as it frequently happened that the list of promotions agreed on was surreptitiously increased by the addition of new names. This was the crafty handiwork of the accomplished dame, the duke having employed her as his amanuensis, and being accustomed to sign her autograph lists without examination. Society in London in 1814 In the year 1814 my battalion of the guards was once more in its old quarters in Portman Street Barracks, enjoying the fame of our Spanish campaign. Good society at the period to which I refer was, to use a familiar expression, wonderfully select. At the present time one can hardly conceive the importance which was attached to getting admission to Almack's, the seventh heaven of the fashionable world. Of the three hundred officers of the foot guards, not more than half a dozen were honoured with vouchers of admission to this exclusive temple of the beau monde, the gates of which were guarded by lady patronesses, whose smiles or frowns consigned men and women to happiness or despair. These lady patronesses were the ladies Castlereagh, Jersey, Cooper and Sefton, Mrs. Drummond Burrell, now Lady Willoughby, the Princess Esterhazy, and the Countess Leven. The most popular amongst these grandes dames was unquestionably Lady Cooper, now Lady Palmerston. Lady Jersey's bearing, on the contrary, was that of a theatrical tragedy queen, and whilst attempting the sublime, she frequently made herself simply ridiculous, being inconceivably rude, and in her manner often ill-bred. Lady Sefton was kind and amiable, Madame de Leven haughty and exclusive, Princess Esterhazy was a bon enfant, Lady Castlereagh and Mrs. Burrell de très grande dame. Many diplomatic arts, much finesse, and a host of intrigues were set in motion to get an invitation to Ormac's. Very often persons whose rank and fortunes entitled them to the entree anywhere were excluded by the cliqueism of the lady patronesses. For the female government of Almax was a pure despotism, and subject to all the caprices of despotic rule. It is needless to add that, like every other despotism, it was not innocent of abuses. The fair ladies who ruled supreme over this little dancing and gossiping world issued a solemn proclamation that no gentleman should appear at the assemblies without being dressed in knee-breeches, white cravat, and chapeau bras. On one occasion the Duke of Wellington was about to ascend the staircase of the ballroom, dressed in black trousers, when the vigilant Mr. Willis, the guardian of the establishment, stepped forward and said, your grace cannot be admitted in trousers. Whereupon the duke, who had a great respect for orders and regulations, quietly walked away. In 1814 the dances at Almax were Scotch reels and the old English country dance, and the orchestra, being from Edinburgh, was conducted by the then celebrated Neil Gow. It was not until 1815 that Lady Jersey introduced from Paris the favourite quadrille, which has so long remained popular. I recollect the persons who formed the very first quadrille that was ever danced at Almax. They were Lady Jersey, Lady Harriet Butler, Lady Susan Ryder, and Miss Montgomery, the men being the Count St. Aldegonde, Mr. Montgomery, Mr. Montague, and Charles Standish. 
The Mazy Waltz was also brought to us about this time, but there were comparatively few who at first ventured to whirl round the salons of Olmack's. In course of time, Lord Palmerston might, however, have been seen describing an infinite number of circles with Madame de Lieven. Baron de Neumann was frequently seen perpetually turning with the Princess Esterhazy, and in course of time the waltzing mania, having turned the heads of society generally, descended to their feet, and the waltz was practised in the morning in certain noble mansions in London with unparalleled assiduity. The dandies of society were Beau Brummel, of whom I shall have to say something on another occasion, the Duke of Argyle, the Lords Worcester, Alvanley and Foley, Henry Pierpoint, John Mills, Bradshaw, Henry de Rose, Charles Standish, Edward Montague, Hervey Aston, Dan Mackinnon, George Dawson Damer, Lloyd, commonly known as Rufus Lloyd, and others who have escaped my memory. They were great frequenters of White's Club in St. James's Street, where in the famous bay window they mustered in force. Drinking and play were more universally indulged in then than at the present time, and many men still living must remember the couple of bottles of port at least which accompanied his dinner in those days. Indeed, female society amongst the upper classes was most notoriously neglected, except perhaps by romantic foreigners, who were the heroes of many a fashionable adventure that fed the clubs with ever-acceptable scandal. How could it be otherwise, when husbands spent their days in the hunting-field, or were entirely occupied with politics, and always away from home during the day, whilst the dinner-party, commencing at seven or eight, frequently did not break up before one in the morning? There were then four and even five bottle-men, and the only thing that saved them was drinking very slowly and out of very small glasses. The learned head of the law, Lord Eldon, and his brother, Lord Stowell, used to say that they had drunk more bad port than any two men in England. Indeed, the former was rather apt to be overtaken, and to speak occasionally somewhat thicker than natural, after long and heavy potations. The late Lords Panmure, Dufferin, and Blaney, wonderful to relate, were six bottle men at this time and I really think that if the good society of 1815 could appear before their more moderate descendants, in the state they were generally reduced to after dinner, the moderns would pronounce their ancestors fit for nothing but bed. THE ITALIAN OPERA CATALANI The greatest vocalist of whom I have a recollection is Madame Catalani. In her youth she was the finest singer in Europe and she was much sought after by all the great people during her séjour in London. She was extremely handsome, and was considered a model as wife and mother. Catalani was very fond of money, and would never sing unless paid beforehand. She was invited, with her husband, to pass some time at Stowe, where a numerous but select party had been invited, and Madame Catalani, being asked to sing soon after dinner, willingly complied. When the day of her departure came, her husband placed in the hands of the Marquis of Buckingham the following little billet. For seventeen songs, seventeen hundred pounds. This large sum was paid at once, without hesitation, proving that Lord Buckingham was a refined gentleman in every sense of the word. Catalani's husband, Monsieur de Valabrec, once fought a duel with a German baron who had insulted the prima donna. The weapons used were sabres, and Valabrec cut half of the baron's nose clean off. Madame Catalani lived for many years, highly respected, at a handsome villa near Florence. Her two sons are now distinguished members of the imperial court in Paris, the eldest being Prophet du Palais, and the youngest colonel of a regiment of hussars. When George the Fourth was regent, Her Majesty's Theatre, as the Italian opera in the Haymarket is still called, was conducted on a very different system from that which now prevails. 
some years previous to the period to which I refer, no one could obtain a box or a ticket for the pit without a voucher from one of the lady patronesses, who in 1805 were the Duchess of Marlborough, Devonshire and Bedford, Lady Carlisle and some others. In their day, after the singing and the ballet were over, the company used to retire into the concert room, where a ball took place accompanied by refreshments and a supper. There all the rank and fashion of England were assembled on a sort of neutral ground. At a later period the management of the opera house fell into the hands of Mr. Waters, when it became less difficult to obtain admittance, but the strictest etiquette was still kept up as regarded the dress of the gentlemen, who were only admitted with knee-buckles, ruffles, and chapeau bras. If there happened to be a drawing-room, the ladies would appear in their court dresses as well as the gentlemen, and on all occasions the audience of Her Majesty's Theatre was stamped with aristocratic elegance. In the boxes of the first tier might have been seen the daughters of the Duchess of Argyle, four of England's beauties. In the next box were the equally lovely Marchioness of Stafford and her daughter, Lady Elizabeth Gore, now the Duchess of Norfolk. Not less remarkable was Lady Harrowby, and her daughters Lady Susan and Lady Mary Ryder. The peculiar type of female beauty, which these ladies so attractively exemplified, is such as can be met with only in the British Isles. The full, round, soul-inspired eye of Italy, and the dark hair of the sunny south, often combined with that exquisitely pearly complexion which seems to be concomitant with humidity and fog. You could scarcely gaze upon the peculiar beauty to which I refer, without being as much charmed with its kindly expression as with its physical loveliness. Dining and Cookery in England Fifty Years Ago England can boast of a Spencer, Shakespeare, Milton, and many other illustrious poets, clearly indicating that the national character of Britons is not deficient in imagination. But we have not had one singular masculine inventive genius of the kitchen. It is the probable result of our national antipathy to mysterious culinary compounds that none of the bright minds of England have ventured into the region of scientific cookery. Even in the best houses when I was a young man, the dinners were wonderfully solid, hot, and stimulating. The menu of a grand dinner was thus composed. Mulligatawny and turtle soups were the first dishes placed before you. A little lower, the eye met with the familiar salmon at one end of the table, and the turbot, surrounded by smelts, at the other. The first course was sure to be followed by a saddle of mutton or a piece of roast beef, and then you could take your oath that fowls, tongue, and ham would as assuredly succeed as darkness after day. Whilst these never-ending pièces de résistance were occupying the table, what were called French dishes were, for custom's sake, added to the solid abundance. The French, or side dishes, consisted of very mild but very abortive attempts at continental cooking, and I have always observed that they met with the neglect and contempt that they merited. The universally adored and ever popular boiled potato, produced at the very earliest period of the dinner, was eaten with everything, up to the moment when sweets appeared. Our vegetables, the best in the world, were never honoured by an accompanying sauce, and generally came to the table cold. A prime difficulty to overcome was the placing on your fork and finally in your mouth, some half-dozen different eatables which occupied your plate at the same time. For example, your plate would contain, say, a slice of turkey, a piece of stuffing, a sausage, pickles, a slice of tongue, cauliflower and potatoes. According to habit and custom, a judicious and careful selection from this little bazaar of good things was to be made with an endeavour to place a portion of each in your mouth at the same moment. In fact, it appeared to me that we used to do all our compound cookery between our jaws. The dessert, 
generally ordered at Messrs. Grange's or at Owen's in Bond Street, if for a dozen people would cost at least as many pounds. The wines were chiefly port, sherry, and hock, claret and even burgundy being then designated poor, thin, washy stuff. A perpetual thirst seemed to come over people, both men and women, as soon as they had tasted their soup, as from that moment everybody was taking wine with everybody else till the close of the dinner, and such wine as produced that class of cordiality which frequently wanders into stupefaction. How all this sort of eating and drinking ended was obvious, from the prevalence of gout, and the necessity of every one making the pill-box their constant bedroom companion. End of section 2. Recording by Ruth Golding.